a couple of years ago I put together this video called A Room With A View. Brilliant pun there, I should do something like that again one day. It was featuring a number of different music visualisation devices, and if you're being particularly pedantic, no, they weren't really VU meters, they were more sort of peak line level output type displays. But anyway, that wasn't the last of the ones I bought, I just haven't updated you with any of the ones I bought more recently. You see, every time I see a new or interesting looking one on eBay, I go and pick it up. So let me start off by showing you this one, which I've had for a little while now, but it's still on sale if you wanted to buy one, but I'll show you why you probably shouldn't. It takes a three and a half millimeter line level input and it's got a USB micro B to power it. All off the shelf components here soldered together for a relatively cheap price, but it does look like it. And of course it really does need to go into some kind of a case if you were going to use this properly. I've noticed that these things peel off as I started shooting when I saw the glare, so I'll need to peel all those off. So let's go on and have a look at the way I'm going to be testing these things. First off, the music. It's coming from Vibe Tracks. That's from the YouTube audio library. Hopefully no content matches there. I've had a bit of a hassle with that recently. And moving on, stereo test. This is just to check that both channels are being represented. And finally, we've got a sine sweep, which is a logarithmic scale. And that is a tone that sweeps from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz over the course of 20 seconds. So it goes from a low pitch up to a high pitch. The reason I've got this is because I want to test whether or not a spectrum analyzer that I'll be showing you later on in the video is accurately representing the frequencies that are going into it. This is the one on my hi-fi that's displaying it properly. As the frequency increases, the bars move from the left to the right. However, in the previous video, I demonstrated a multicolor spectrum analyzer that looked interesting until I realized it was just displaying the bars randomly Randomly, they bore no relationship to the frequency, so I can test that very easily this time. Now the reason I'm going to start off by testing things using this Walkman is because it's got two outputs. We've got a headphone on the side and we've got a line out on the back. So the line out is going off to my speakers and a headphone output is the one that's going off to the devices we're going to test out. So of course this means that we can hear what's being played into them and therefore we can see whether or not the displays are reacting accurately. Now you'll notice this one is split down the middle between the left and right channels, but you might also have spotted I've got a dead column here, which presumably is down to bad connection of some sort, because I've noticed if I put a bit of pressure on this, it does light up again, but as soon as I let go, it goes off. Also, I tried the frequency sweep on this. Notice how it starts at both sides because of course left and right channels, and it is going as it should do. The frequencies are getting represented by the columns lighting up, but that blank one is a bit of an issue there. So I thought I'll take it apart. It's just got connectors on either end. Just see if I could spot any dry solder joints or things that weren't properly connected. They looked okay to me, so I put some contact cleaner on at the ends just in case it was something to do with the pins not connecting up, but I uh, don't think it was that because now I've got three dead ones. I suspect if I really wanted to get this working, I could spend some more time over it, perhaps go through and look at every joint of solder on there and resolder any that weren't properly connected. As far as the left and right sides go, I can see that they are working independently from one another. If I just play the right through it, it just shows up on the right hand side. Also with this one, if you leave it alone for a few seconds with no audio coming through it, it goes into a clock mode, which is quite difficult to read. Also difficult to set. There are two buttons in the middle here, just about the width of one finger. So trying to press those independently is quite difficult. One, you hold it down to get into the set mode, then you do the other one to advance the digits, then press the other one to move to the next set of numbers. And that's what it looks like at 1717. So you can just about read it, but those digits aren't ideal for a clock. I noticed this web address on the back of the circuit board, so I typed it in and it leads to a website that's in Chinese that appears to be using as many stock photos as it's possible to fit on one page. I had to click around, looked at one of those links at the top, and it brought up this picture of a really crap looking robot with a tablet in its chest that seems to be just about able to hold a table with nothing on it at a slightly obtuse angle. So I think I'll hold off my pre-order on that one. But back to the matter in hand, I've got to say this is something I cannot recommend. It doesn't work very well and it's badly put together. It costs £28. I think it's one to cross off the list. So let's move on to item two out of the three items I'm showing you in this video. Now this one I bought a few months ago again from eBay from China. 
Definitely better quality than the other device though. Got a remote control here, which is off some kind of media player, but you only use a few buttons on that. We've got a three and a half millimeter mini jack splitter. Got an unusual cable on this one because this end has got a USB plug and a three and a half millimeter mini jack. The other end just terminates in a micro USB. Now the device itself doesn't really look like anything. It's an aluminium case with a glossy black screen on the front. But until you plug it in, you probably wouldn't have any idea what this did. There are no buttons on it at all. The only socket is that single micro USB port on the back, which supplies it with the power and the audio from the device you plugged into the other end. So let's plug it in and see what it does. Now I should mention when this powers up, it does look a little bit flickery on camera, but of course that's down to shooting it with a camera. Difference between refresh rates and shutter speeds and things in person, you don't notice any flicker on this. You will notice, however, that it does jump between the time and the date automatically, but there's no way to control it at all from the device itself. There are no touch controls on here. It's purely driven by that remote control. And of course, the remote control buttons don't relate really to what the device does because it's a remote control from a different kind of device. So it's a matter of pressing random buttons to see what happens. Not all of them do something. Now, the first thing I needed to do was to set the day and time. And I found out that if I held down a button on the right hand side, it then got me into the setting procedure and I could set the clock. So once I got that sorted, I then played some music into it. I presumed it would automatically go into the music display once it heard some audio. It didn't do that, but I think that's because I didn't have it in auto mode. There is a button which will switch between auto mode and clock. So once I'd pressed that, the music display came straight on. Now, whilst there's music playing into this, you can access various different display modes by pressing up and down on the remote control. So you can have dots with peaks or bars with peaks or just the peaks or the peaks fly off the top of the screen. All slight variations on a theme. And of course, this isn't a multicolor device, so it's all green dots on a black background, but quite effective. Let's try that sine wave sweep now to see how accurate it is. I'm playing it through this digital media player because I've now got that headphone splitter so I can send the audio off to the speakers and to the device without having to put it through the cassette deck. And you can see here it displays all the bars. I've sped that up because it was taking a little bit too long. But here it is again. You can see it goes all the way from the left to the right hand side. Very accurate. So yeah, accurate little display. Also, it has the ability to display the volume level in this mode with the left and right channels. And if I try my left and right test, that's working accurately as well. The only thing I think I should really stress about this particular device is though that it's tiny I mean it looks good on camera and of course I've got it zoomed up to get a nice display on here but if I bring the camera back it really is a tiny little device and I'm not too sure what use something like this is after all most people would want something like this to add a bit of bling to a hi-fi well you'll have to be about a foot away from it before you can see the display on this one. Here it is next to a cassette, about the same width as a cassette box, perhaps half the height or just a little bit over. So yeah, tiny little display, very well made though, works excellently, but it also costs quite a bit as well. So it's down to you whether or not you'd find that useful. But let's move on to the last device. Now this one's quite a bit different from the first two. It's no longer being manufactured. It's a professional type device. It was made in Germany. It's the RTW1206. This one will take XLR balanced or line level unbalanced inputs. And also it runs on multi-voltage and is powered from a wall power supply. It's just a stereo peak meter, this one. So no need for my sweep frequency test. But as you can see on the stereo test, it's functioning perfectly. So let's have a look at it with some music being played. find those kinds of displays very attractive to look at with that orange glow very similar to Nixie tubes in fact I thought it was two Nixies two IN13s one stacked on top of the other this is an IN13 
commonly used in musical display output type devices, but also in this thermometer. However, you'll notice these go red once you get past the zero point and Nixes are just that orange colour, but you'll see there is a coloured film behind there which will change the colour to red once it gets past that zero decibel point. So, what kind of displays are actually inside this box? Well, I had to have a look to see if it was two iron 13s, and it's not. It's a, a different display, one I haven't seen before. It's all contained in this glass panel along the front, no doubt some kind of vacuum fluorescent technology. You can see the pins on the left that are bent around here and connected up there. At the other end though, we've got some model details. We can see it was made by a company called Miton in Japan, and those are the model numbers above there if you want to look this one up. But speaking as someone who's really interested in these musical display type devices, VU meters, power meters, peak meters, all that kind of stuff, I look for these online and I have never seen this unit used in any other piece of equipment. Perhaps the manufacturer just sold it to RTW, maybe that was a big enough market for them. But it's such a nice display. If it had been available to other people, I can imagine it turning up in things like cassette decks, but again, maybe it's a very expensive display technology that could only really be put to use in this professional equipment, because if you were to try and put it in, say, a consumer cassette deck, it would just add too much to the price. I notice these holes on either side. When I took the lid off, I had a look to see what was connected to, and the answer was nothing. It turns out that they're holes for this stand, which wasn't on mine. No doubt they took that off to make it fit in a rack or something. But yeah, I'll put it back together again. Very impressed with the way this has been built. And I noticed this sticker on the bottom, News in Berlin. So I looked up that address and they've changed the name now to Cine Plus, but the studio is still there. So no doubt at one point, my little peak meter was in a studio like this. And I also looked up RTW, the manufacturers of the 1206 peak meter, and I'm happy to see that they're still in business too. They're based in Cologne and still manufacturing equipment for the recording industry, although a lot higher level than my little peak meter. However, that 1206 seems to be a bit of a celebrity. Back in 2009, RTW was celebrating its 30th anniversary. And as a result of that, they came up with a nice little logo and a competition. They wanted to find the people with the oldest working 1206. So you could put your serial number in on their website and it would tell you how old it was. And the winner would receive either a weekend in Cologne or a new peak meter. Apparently they'd made 25,000 of these units by then and they were still manufacturing them. The winner of the competition was a company called Mango Studios, who coincidentally were based in Cologne in Germany, just a few miles away from the headquarters of RTW. So they didn't take up the offer of an all expenses paid holiday there. Instead, they got the new peak meter. Mango Studios, incidentally, are still in business as well. And I had a look on their website just to see if they're still using their 1206. And I spotted a picture of it here, although of course I don't know how old that picture is. But reading about this competition had intrigued me as to how old my particular meter was. A serial number of 6093 indicates it's not one of the earliest models from 1979, but given the construction, it could be from quite a broad age range. So I got in touch with the manufacturer to ask them and they got back to me within half an hour and told me it was from October 1991. So excellent service from RTW there. Looking now on their website though, there's nothing like this meter. They seem to be doing these touchscreen devices, which are no doubt much more sophisticated and useful to people who need them for the industry that they're in. But it's a bit of a shame that the 1206 was discontinued. It's showing on their archive page. So no doubt that's sometime after 2009. Perhaps it was down to that display. I get the feeling that they would have wanted to keep making this if they could have done. It was one of their flagship products. I suspect that the company that made that display for them just said, we can't make it anymore. After all, how many companies do you know in the world that are still making Nixie type displays? Even those Russian ones seem to discontinue sometime in the 90s. And I know there's people making new Nixie tubes now, but still a display to remain on the market for that long is quite unusual. Okay, it's the recap. Let's go back to the beginning. The first one, didn't like that one at all. It didn't really work properly and it was badly put together. So moving on, the next one, very well put together, worked well, top quality, but just 
much too small for the vast majority of people. I mean, what's this, a spectrum analyzer for ants? But if you can think of a use for that one, then nice little product, although quite expensive as well. And then the final one, well, of course, that was my favorite out of the lot, but there was a second hand and quite difficult to find at times, although there are a lot out there and they can fetch quite high prices every now and then, given that they come from the recording industry. But I'll put links to search for that and the previous product in the video description text box. And I've got some more VU meters to show you. I plan to show you more in this video, but I ran out of time. I didn't want to go beyond 15 minutes. So I've got another four that I can show you in a future video, but that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. Ah! My ears! What is this? It's me Commodore 64! I'll turn the sound down. Some people just don't appreciate the SID chip. It's still happening! I'm dying here! What are you on about? The sound's off! It's a high-pitched whine that's drilling through my skull! Oh, that'll be coming off the CRT! It's literally killing me to death. When you get older, you can't hear it anymore. Well, what about all the young people who can? Don't overreact. It's just a sound. You'll get used to it. I don't want to get used to it. It's going to give me a myocardial infarction. Every single telly that I watched for decades was a CRT. And there's still the best way to play these old computers. I think it's made me blind in one eye. And I've got this metal taste in my mouth. So, are you saying that if you were my age, you wouldn't have been able to watch any television until flat screens came in? Yes, I am. Turn it off. I think my brain can smell the future. And next Thursday is the colour blue. <sighs> it's a little bit ironic that while I can't hear high frequencies anymore, I'm having to put up with this loud whining. I can't feel my feet now. Or is it my hands? I'm fading away. You should enjoy your hearing while you've got it, not complain about how good it is. I'm heading towards the light. Goodbye, cruel world.